Welcome to Turtle Island Talks, a serious XM town hall. Indigenous health in Canada is an urgent issue. Infant mortality rates are four times higher than non-Indigenous rates. Suicide rates among Indigenous people are consistently higher than non-Indigenous people. Indigenous peoples are diagnosed with diabetes at a younger age and experience poorer treatment outcomes. What is driving these grim statistics and what are the solutions? We're discussing this in our second edition of the series, Turtle Island Talks. Please welcome our host, Dr. Pamela Palmiter, a Mi'kmaq lawyer from Eel River Bar First Nation and the chair in Indigenous Governance at Ryerson University. In the midst of a global pandemic, healthcare has been the top of mind for so many of us. Access to quality healthcare is important for our families. But for Indigenous peoples, Accessing healthcare can be a real challenge, and some are reluctant to seek out healthcare, even when it is available, because of, well, let's face it, racism. We wanted to examine healthcare for Indigenous peoples because it impacts the health, safety, and well being of Indigenous families and communities. And we wanted you, our listeners, to have a more in depth understanding of the lived experiences of First Nations, Inuit, and Metis peoples. Turtle Island Talks aims to critically reflect on all possible avenues of reconciliation. And we know that physical, mental, and spiritual health is the key to well being. An important part of reconciliation is truth. And the truth can be hard to hear when the health statistics are so alarming. So the question is, what can we do about it? Today, we'll be dropping in on one-on-one -on -one conversations with our fantastic Sirius XM hosts, Peter Mansbridge and Arlene Bynan, who'll be talking with Indigenous experts like Senator Michelle Odette and Dr. Marie Wilson, former commissioner of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But right now, I'd love to introduce you to our awesome panelists. So first we have Dr. Evan Adams, a member of Pla'amen First Nation from the Upper Sunshine Coast of BC. And he also serves as Chief Medical Officer of the First Nations Health Authority in BC. And he's also an award-winning actor. Yeah, anyone remember him from those iconic movies? I do. That's him. Welcome to the show, Dr. Evan. <laughs> I'm just going, Pam. I'm so glad to be here. We also have Melanie McKinnon, who is a member of Missipawistic Cree Nation and currently serves as the executive director of Ongamazin Health Services. And she's also the head of the Indigenous Institute of Health and Healing, Rady Faculty of Health Sciences. And if that wasn't enough, she also just happens to be one of the top 100 most powerful women in Canada for 2021, according to the Women's Executive Network. So you know, with these two amazing people, this is going to be a great conversation. Thank you, Pam. So happy to be here. Oh, I'm so happy to have you. We're going to look at health for both the historical context in order to understand current health conditions, to understand where we need to go from here. Almost 30 years ago, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples released their report, which highlighted the impoverished socioeconomic conditions of Indigenous peoples and shared more than 400 recommendations, including how to address health. 20 years later, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015 made similar calls to action to improve Indigenous health and address systemic racism. The same concerns were echoed in the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls National Inquiry in 2019 with similar recommendations. And once again, little action was taken. So it shouldn't be any surprise then that the BC report on racism in healthcare in 2021 found systemic racism against Indigenous peoples continued to impact their physical, mental, and spiritual health. This is exactly why we're focusing on Indigenous health today. So thank you so much for joining us to be a part of the solutions moving forward. Now, let's dig in. 1991. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples was established with a five-volume report being delivered in October 1996. It was mandated to investigate and propose solutions to the challenges affecting the relationship between First Nations, Inuit, and the Métis 
with the Canadian government and Canadian society as a whole. RCAP recommended mainstream institutions should consider and implement strategies to extend understanding of and respect for traditional health and healing practices. Please welcome our guests, Sirius XM hosts Arlene Bynan and spiritual healer, wisdom and knowledge keeper, Mary Wilson. I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Wilson, if we could begin, if you could just give us some uh, ground cover here, if you could describe what traditional medicine practice is. Well, traditional medicine practice can be many different things. It could be, um, it could be gathering medicine. It could be working with Western medicine doctors. It could be healing. It could be ceremony it can be many different things one of the problems that we've had and one of the barriers is that through the colonial practices through the colonial oppression uh, the medicine people were forced underground and so when you have your medicine world and your ceremonies made actually illegal it makes it extremely difficult to keep that that cultural piece alive so now i come from a long line of medicine people so um as a medicine person as a healer it takes time to have all those pieces be gathered again it takes time for that trust in the communities to uh be able to work within those those parameters of of no longer feeling oppressed and yet they are and still are it's because we have a lot of racism and so the medicine work that i do is different than some of the medicine work that other people do i have different uh, ceremonies that i i work with i have uh, i'm a seer so i am a spirit walker so i work a lot with the ancestors and and trusting the knowledge that they give to me with the people individually um so my medicine work is a little bit different than others other people have prescriptions that they can actually go and create through the medicines that they gather i know some but i am not that type of medicine woman it takes many different types of modalities in our medicine world to create that uh that wellness it does, you know, as you talk about that and working together, and that was one of the recommendations that came up from the Royal Commission of Aboriginals People. So um, that was a long time ago. That was in the 1990s. And, and they recommended the fusion of all those things. And that is going to really help with the medical care for Indigenous people. Have has this happened i mean so many of these recommendations have sounded so good and they look good on paper but we don't see them being implemented is this one of them this is one of the things that we really need to work with because because we're just finding most people didn't believe that that oppression and that genocidal attacks on on a nation in north america even happened there was so much denial and so much racism attached to it that it was really, really difficult to work through those those uh, barricades. But as time and as as they're unearthing all these the grades, there it's more like, oh my God, this really did happen, and it did, and we know it, but we have lots to teach and share. And so instead of us going to to the scholars we have our own scholars we're reversing it it needs to reverse so those medicine people can work and help western doctors eastern doctors like for us to be uh connecting because our knowledge is vast and because we are connected to the earth and that we are related to everything it makes our medicine very powerful very powerful so as time is progressing it's very important that we share this knowledge and get these things going because they're not complete yet far from it 
but it's starting to come a little bit more to the table and a little bit more to the table. It'd be great if we could just say, hey, this is what's happening. Let's have a, a hospital or a, a medical facility that uh, engages health from a holistic practice alongside of the Western knowledge. Like there's a place for everything. How do you see it working on the ground? How does it work in real life? What kind of what kind of accomplishments do you think that are possible now if this is indeed that moment and all these things come together? I think that there is an opportunity here to bring together the healers of the world and start working to go toward a common goal, which is relational wellness. We can't heal one without the other. We're all related. Every tree, every root from the top of the sky, you know, from the, from the stars, we hear of all the things going up in space and right down to the center of that root. Well, we're just here on our mother uh, walking together, uh, trying to be in harmony, which we are not. Which the healers and the medicine people can bring that harmony. There is no doubt in my mind. What an important conversation between Mary and Arlene. Um, traditional medicine and cultural health practices of Indigenous peoples is such an important part of the conversation around Indigenous health, but doesn't really seem to get the attention it deserves. Dr. Evan, you know, this first question is for you. How have you seen a growth in Indigenous health practices in hospitals and healthcare settings? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, have I seen a growth in traditional health practices? Uh, no, because uh, I, I um, uh, a group of Indigenous people who were on a cancer journey and almost like 199 out of 200 of them were using traditional medicine. So that tells me we're still using traditional medicines. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was surprised by that, but then now I'm not surprised. Um, in the in the healthcare system, we are starting to see some recognition of it, but it's definitely not enough. Because the uh, what I call the white gaze, and I'm probably using that term incorrectly, but um, you know that Western viewpoint is so pervasive. We almost never are in a situation like this where we can say, well, what about our ways and our practices? Can we? Um, uh, how are they doing? Um, and uh, from from the from the Western point of view, um, they're still not a significant uh, player in our health. What do you think the impediment is to moving forward with, you know, combining Indigenous health practices with Western health practices when it's been a frequent recommendation? Again, a good question. I, I suspect it's because uh, they, the Western system and academics, um, largely have not seen us. Uh, they haven't seen us. They haven't seen our practices. They haven't seen our languages. They they don't know our beliefs. They don't know where our, our ways of being. They don't know our, our values. They, um, yeah. So I I don't know how we were rendered invisible, where they like their eyes are open but they don't see us. It's definitely something that they have to um, unlearn. And so, you know, how can they trust um, our ways of being and knowing in our traditional knowledge and traditional medicines is not maybe not quite real to them. Exactly. And, you know, Melanie, um, the way in which healthcare is very much controlled by certain, you know, institutions and governments and bodies that hasn't really allowed for First Nations or Métis or Inuit to have those kinds of decision-making capacities, but the request by Indigenous peoples to have Indigenous health practices as well as Indigenous healthcare practitioners within these settings isn't new. How, how important is it in all of these healthcare settings to have this included? Well, Pam, I'm happy to be here and happy to see you again. And uh, I'm definitely a fan girl. Um, I think that's a really big question. And to, you know, Evan's point, there is a lot that the mainstream healthcare system needs to learn about us. But on the flip side of that, we are dealing with decades and centuries of us not trusting mainstream systems and us not wanting to share our medicines and share our teachings to that kind of broader audience, if you will, and maintain 
some of our own oversight and quote unquote control over that. With that said, we still have a lot of kind of, um, you know, uh, work to do in relation to designing instruments to be able to support that work and, and create those mechanisms so that there's more inclusion. We're still not remunerating our elders anywhere near the expertise that we would for nurses and physicians, for example, regardless of their years and decades of experience and expertise. Um, we're still very, very protective of our medicines, which we need to be. We've gone through um, or have some historical uh, significance in relation to taking some of our medicine and, and commercializing that. And we know that's not within our teachings. And, you know, the perfect example is aspirin with, you know, re with respect to the red willow bark, right? So um, when it can be mutually um, accountable and reciprocal, that's a different conversation. But I don't think that power has been balanced yet. And it can only be balanced by those knowledge keepers, by those healers, People like Dr. Evan and I, or Evan Adams and I, like we're facilitators. We're happy to, you know, um, carve those pathways out. And um, but we we follow the leadership of our knowledge keepers and our elders, and you know what they're comfortable with. But that said, there's a minute amount of space that has been made, you know, within that acute care health care system. Whether they've changed ventilation systems so that we can allow smudging, whether they um, allow for other healers. Uh, and ceremonies to take place, or or they even have created some you know physical capital infrastructure for those ceremonies to be uh, in house, if you will. But a lot of our access to medicine people and our healers is outside of the system, and I kind of think that's okay too because that speaks to our individual autonomy as to who we're seeking care from, and it can absolutely be complementary and integrated, but at the direction of you know the individual. Right. It doesn't have to be in competition. We can work with these knowledges together based on you know what what indigenous peoples and patients want from all of this and i and i think you know even where you get health care sometimes it has to be in a hospital but there's no reason why it can't be on the land sometimes there's no reason why it can't be in your home and in, in your community so both of you have raised really important points that were you know addressed not just in our cap but our cap was quite some time ago, but let's take a look at the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and see what they said about health. 2015, 94 calls to action were established as part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Call to action number 24 calls upon the education of the healthcare system and personnel dealing with Indigenous health issues. Please welcome Peter Mansbridge of Sirius XM's The Bridge and Dr. Mary Wilson, the former commissioner for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So what we want to talk about today is one of the 94 calls to action by the TRC, and it was number 24, which calls upon the education of the healthcare system and personnel dealing with Indigenous health issues. So why don't we start with the basics? What's the importance of having a mandatory course in Indigenous peoples as a requirement for work in the healthcare system? Well, I would just say even wider than health, the fact is that over the six and a half years of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, first of its kind um, to be in the Western world, the so-called developed world, uh, one of the things that became glaringly clear is the degree of ignorance around this part of our history and what had happened. And that then also became apparent across multiple sectors, including the medical sector. It was very clear that many doctors and nurses who often tend to see themselves in the helping profession, the profession that is part of the solution when there are challenges, hadn't realized to what extent they had also been part of the problem and in the eyes of many continue to be part of the problem. And so helping people understand where they fit in this story, that it isn't all about governments can fix everything, it isn't all about Indigenous peoples can figure their way through all of this as if it were up to them alone, um, but for all sectors of society, including um, prestigious um, uh, professional um, groups such as doctors and nurses, that they too would understand how they fit in. And how they fit in the history, you know, one of the facts that uh, people still do not fully realize is that we had segregated 
hospitals in Canada. We had so-called Indian hospitals. We had children who were in residential school who were sent away from the residential schools, um, often very, very ill, to southern institutions, often for things like tuberculosis. And many of those are among the children um, who went missing. We've heard a lot in, in this past year in particular, people have started to pay more attention to what we reported on in our volume four of our report, which is all about the missing children and the unmarked graves. And some of those children were uh, hospital victims that never made it home. Um, well, I'll just, I'll pause on that to say that the other part of medicine, we have, I think, far too long in our history thought about medicine as a, as a physical fix-up uh, activity, as opposed to the whole person. And I know the whole sphere of medicine is, has evolved tremendously in, in more recent years and is seeing um, the wellness of the whole person. Um, but it is absolutely so that the crisis of mental health needs, the epidemic rates of suicide in many Indigenous communities can be traced in terms of family lineage and community impacts um, to things that happen to children in residential schools, the undiagnosed, untreated trauma that came from those adverse childhood experiences um, and the impacts that continue to play out today. And that's why it's so important that today's doctors and nurses understand where they've come from. So they'll know how to, um, in a most helpful healing way, as per their calling, uh, contribute to going forward in a better way from here. One of the things we called for, and people talk a lot about our 94 calls to action, but we also issued an interim report it was part of our obligation, and we issued an interim report, and it had 20 initial interim calls to action. And one of those was very specifically about the critical and urgent need uh, for healing centers, especially in northern Canada. So in other words, for anyone who would say, why don't they just get over it, is because it's so far from being over. Um, and uh, But the other thing that it talked about is... Um, the validity in finding a form of accreditation for all of those people who had worked as health supports throughout the work of the TRC and other elements of the settlement agreement. Because it's like any other uh, job where you would be doing frontline apprenticing with hands-on work and tough work, hard work, and uh, performing it well and performing it to a very high standard. And of course, that wasn't the case for everybody, but it was the case for many, many, many people. And it allows communities to start to see themselves not as impoverished in every measurable way, but as having great strengths within their communities as well, including people who have proven competencies in the area of uh, outreach and care and personal support. So I hope uh, that when we talk about more people in the field, we're talking about all those levels. Not everyone's going to be a doctor. Not everyone's going to be a nurse. Um, there's a whole lot of other spiritual care that is also health giving. Um, there is, uh, um, there is uh, mental health care that is also health giving and all of these other um, elements of, uh, of the integrity of the human being and the well-being of, of individuals and therefore of the collective, so we're not wreaking further damage on each other. What an important conversation between Peter and Dr. Marie, because I wonder how many Canadians were aware that there used to be segregated Indian hospitals and the substandard care or the people that went missing from those hospitals. And there's no doubt that the TRC report has had a profound impact on all Canadians. So many individuals, groups, and organizations have pushed to implement those calls to action. Now, Dr. Evan, one of those calls to action is call to action number 24 about medical and nursing schools in Canada should require all students to take a course dealing with Indigenous health issues, including skills-based training, intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. Do you think that's happening right now? Um, I would say that uh, we're starting to do that, and there are um, ca particular cases of particular schools that have um, have been doing that for a, a number of years and getting better at it. But uh, there are definitely schools um, that have um, only the barest of um, curriculum on Indigenous health. It, it is 
really unfortunate that um, reconciliation uh, has moved so slow in those institutions. And and definitely part of my work is to speak to health institutions and say, how have you moved um, on these issues? Our people need to have safe encounters with your personnel. And we're hearing, let's not be naive, that um, some of our people are saying it's really not safe to go into that institution. I get treated really badly, or I've I've been there already and I was treated really badly mm-hmm. and I don't want to go back. And that does affect um, their outcomes. They're diagnosed later, they're they're treated later in their disease. Um, we use the system less in BC. Indigenous people use the system less, not more. The um the the false belief is that we use the system inappropriately, but we're scared of it, so we actually um, stay away, and we see that in our we see that in our statistics, and that's that's really unfortunate that the that the Western healthcare system um, still doesn't quite know how to take care of us. Now, Melanie, I'd like to get your perspective on this same call to action because it is far more detailed than just simple awareness training. You know, so for decades now, we've been engaged in, you know, awareness training or sensitivity training. But this one talks specifically about cultural safety, anti-racism, and how to incorporate that in healthcare. How important is that? Well, it's incredibly important. Important and you know, I to Evan's point, we all have different experiences across the country. And I'm very, very fortunate to be working in an institution that has come a long way um, and still has more work to do. But to get to work with some of our um, anti-racism uh, specialists, as far as our physicians go, like Dr. Marcia Anderson and Dr. Barry Lavalley, who have paved that way. Dr. Catherine Cook, one of our first physicians graduating more than 35 years ago, and um, you know, those those um, hallways were paved for people like me with a nursing degree and others with uh, occupational therapy and physiotherapy degrees to come in and help with the help the quote unquote institution because it is an institution do better. Um, and I'm really proud to say that with that shared leadership. Uh, in our context, the College of Medicine had gone from 10 hours of Indigenous health curriculum to more than 90 in the four-year undergrad degree program, and that is pretty significant. We have partnered with our um, relatives in BC and did a Manitoba-specific uh, cultural safety training and um, just met about that a couple of days ago. We have a 500 person wait list to take that on an annual basis. We can't purchase enough seats. So there is a shift that's happening depending I think on your region and on the context and on that leadership, both as indigenous health leaders, but also those leaders that are are within those systems or institutions, whether it's the academy or whether it's the healthcare system. And let's not forget those two are intertwined, right? So our experiential experiential learning is in either the community or the acute care system. And so it is a balance between both those pretty powerful um, institutions and to make sure that we're also protecting our own and ensuring that our Indigenous health students and all of our health professional faculties um, are being set up for success and uh, not enabling them, but giving them those other supports so that we can look at what their educational experience is going to be from an equity perspective, because we know that they're already coming with a number of challenges. Um, But in that light, um, Pam, you know, when we talk about increasing the seats, I think a number of institutions have done that and have some seat designation. um, And that's really, really important. But there is a there's an upstream investment that we also need to focus on so that our students are so successful um, with higher graduation rates. And what I'm worried about, you know, we did a few years back, a couple decades back, we did a fantastic job at educating our Indigenous teachers. Um, We have so many Indigenous teachers in many of our communities, and uh, but we didn't do, not yet anyway, is math and science teachers. And so our kids don't have the math and science background, not all of them, some of them do, that we need them to have to be successful in, you know, these science-based health professional programs. And we can do that and we can do better. 
but I just want us to think of this in a in a kind of upstream investment and upstream or reciprocal accountability because we have to prepare our kids, you know, from when they're young. Um, I mean, I don't know about Evan, but I know I was going to be in healthcare when I was 10 years old. So, you know, even that mentorship when you're when you're a little one is really important too. Oh, such important points. I, I mean, really thinking about how there's a whole bunch of stages that lead up to the current system in healthcare. So I, I really appreciate those points. Um, it's important to understand the TRC in that context, but a more recent report is the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. So let's take a look at that one as well. 2019. The National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls examines social, economic, cultural, institutional, and historical causes that contribute to ongoing violence against Indigenous women, girls, and LGBTQ2S+. The Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls National Inquiry, Call for Justice 7.4, calls upon all governments and health service providers to provide necessary resources, including funding, to support the revitalization of Indigenous health, wellness, and child and elder care practices. Please welcome SiriusXM host Siobhan Woodrow and Senator and former Commissioner of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls National Inquiry, Michelle Odette. As we know, the final report of the National Inquiry was released in 2019, and it included some important findings in the relationship with socioeconomic conditions and Indigenous women and girls. So how do you feel socioeconomic issues impact health? It's, 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 it's huge. It's very, very huge. And, uh, and even worse now with uh, this two years of pandemic with COVID. So can you imagine that we're already facing poverty? Most of us are a big majority of us. And then boom, it's very, I don't know in English, how do you say precaire? It was so fragile, you know, to have a job or making sure that there's something uh, that I can bring home to feed my kids and my family. So it's even, uh, for me, I would say worse and scary. I just hung up from a phone with a, a young mother, a student, and wondering how she will uh, make sure that she can continue her uh, studies and feed her kids. It was like, oh, so it's real. It's real. So we know that the reports of racism in healthcare has led to a lack of access to healthcare substandard health care and even serious illness and death like we saw with Joyce Eshaquan. Mm -hmm. So how important is it that we act with urgency now? I I don't know if act uh, it's nothing, you know, if it's strong enough. I think uh, it's an imperative or it's an a legal obligation. Uh, we know what's going on around the world right now, the solidarity with the uh, Ukraine and uh, the people of that country. Uh, sometime deep inside, I tell myself, uh, I stand beside the people around the world, but I still remember that our own people are suffering from systemic racism or uh, many form of uh, genocide, you know, policy genocide that was implemented by the state uh, when this country was built and created and built uh, on us or against us. and. Some will say, no, we're not, but the bias is so rooted that uh, this is why we saw Mr. Sinclair, who was uh, forgotten in the ER, uh, in a hospital. This is why we saw the, 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 the death of Joyce Echaquan and many, many voices behind that uh, video uh, were heard finally. It took her to bring this on a, a video and for me it was like oh what about us it's still happening here in canada and it breaks me so we have to stay strong and make sure that we denounce we change we advocate we promote or we speak the truth yeah and i know that the inquiry called on governments to protect the human rights of indigenous women and girls right and what do you think the link is between human rights and the physical, mental, and spiritual health of Indigenous women and girls? It's all interconnected. 
it's mm -hmm. all together. It's I'm a beater, beat, you know, a beat, and it's we yeah. cannot remove the human rights lens. It, it's all connected. So if we think that we can work in silo to walk beside or sell, uh, save life or pretend that we're doing this for the, the well-being of Indigenous women, we have to have a global approach or a holistic approach. And human rights is one of that beat that it's very uh, necessary. Yeah. It's a must. So what do you think, um, what would you like to see happen next? What do you feel like are our next most immediate steps in this in this place there's so many things but this one for me it's we brought the by with the tears the anger or the voices or all that together uh call uh, a, a, a social change you know with the call for justice and and i'm glad what you said and it's rare that i hear journalists or people uh, with media will say government you add that s to the governments so everybody's responsible no matter where we live and where we are so for me the most important right now it's where you're at with the call for justice how many did you implement how many did you honor so far and for those one you couldn't you didn't or you don't want to go there tell me why so that money monitoring is is so urgent and i'm very blunt very transparent we need to know you know i'm very visual oral tradition also my people with the Inu people um we need to have that ombudsperson or that place that we know what happened or didn't happen so tell us why that accountability every year every year that has to happen for me it's something that i told the minister the government some senators and family members that would be my first right now uh, energy and passion that I will push, you know, the call for justice 1.7 as an example. Such a powerful conversation. Siobhan got right to the heart of the issue that human rights are such a core part of Indigenous health. And I think we're all really fortunate that a person like Michelle is now in the Senate and she has a position where she can push governments to implement the calls for justice. We hear about the calls for action for the TRC, but there's so little emphasis on the National Inquiry's calls for justice. And, and it's incredible. We have to remember, Canada was found guilty of both historic and ongoing genocide, and particularly a gendered form of colonial violence against Indigenous women and girls. And so we know that racism and violence have a direct impact on Indigenous physical, mental, and spiritual health of Indigenous women and girls, families, and entire communities. And Melanie, I'm wondering what you think, because in the calls for justice, it recommended establishing crisis response teams in communities to help those in trauma, whether it's physical, sexual, mental health, wellness. You work closely with First Nations in Manitoba. Have you seen this important call for justice starting to be implemented? I think there's a number of organizations doing incredible work in relation to mental health. Can we do more? Absolutely. Has the pandemic taught us that we have to do more for sure? Um, and I think that that has to expand to your earlier point, Pam, around recognizing, um, or to the former commissioner, recognizing you know, our community assets, our community strengths, our community expertise um and investing you know in our own people to be those natural helpers that they are to recognize them for the knowledge that they already have and hold uh if there's different degrees of certification um, or coaching that we need to do let's look at that uh, but let's look at home first um mm -hmm. always going to need that additional external support because our resources are finite let's be honest the system was not only built in segregation it was built on scarcity it was the bare minimum that our governments needed to invest in to attend to you know basically band-aid solutions up until very recently and so that is what we've inherited and, and trying to create programs and design programs to meet current need is, of course, what we have to do. 
but we have to look into the future as well and start understanding some metrics, start understanding some standards of care that we can hold our funders accountable to. Mm -hmm. You know, what is that outcome going to be? And what is it going to take to get there? And what are those standards in, um, that we need to be following, not just around clinical standards of care and competency, but anti-racism. And, you know, I'm really proud of the work that's going on um, in BC right now around, you know, that those criteria and those standards of care, because to, you know, the Senator's point around an ombudsman, that's great. But what are we measuring against, right? We're talking a lot about a qualitative experience um, that could come down to a he said, she said. Um, that, you know, we're dealing with a lot of covert racism as well, right? It's not so much, um, or that it's institutional, that it's just so ingrained, we don't even understand that's the behavior that we're, that we're exuding. So, you know, I, I think that there's incredible work being done, way more has to get done, but we also have to talk about how we're going to do this. It's, it's, I, I respect all of the calls to justice and one that comes to mind that we do have something um, uh, fairly imminently that we can tend to is in the child and family service system with respect to birth alerts. Why are we still doing that? Why is it that my niece who was in the CFS system, you know, and aged out, had a baby, but because she was in that system, regardless of her sobriety, regardless of her healthy relationship, regardless of her excitement and her readiness to be a mother, that, that, that she was flagged and she was reviewed and her baby was taken. Why is that so happening today? That is the trauma that our, our women and our girls are going through. And us as clinical leaders, we have an opportunity, well, sorry, a responsibility mm -hmm. to hold our colleagues accountable for them to do better and to understand who we are and and that our cultural um our cultural ways of being knowing and doing might not look like theirs but it doesn't mean that they're wrong and it doesn't mean that they're not safe i hope that makes sense no it does such critically important points for all of us to take into consideration one of the points i want to follow up on you know you're talking about funding or resources to be able to do these things uh, Dr. Evan, you know, in the in the calls for justice from the National Inquiry, it was recommended that governments ensure substantive equality in funding for healthcare services for Indigenous women and girls, uh, as well as substantive equality in funding for Indigenous-run health services. Uh, how it, I mean. It seems like a silly question, but how fundamental is that for us to make progress? Yeah, it's hard to make change um, without resources. Um, absolutely, and I and I think um, uh, many of the health issues that we see now, many of that we've just outlined and described, um, are, are related to um, being impoverished and also related to a lack of self determination. Mm -hmm. That our people used to have um, a number of things, health. Um, wealth, a, a way of being and knowing, and that was interrupted. So I think of uh, our colonial hangover as being health interrupted. And uh, in there is the issue of self-determination, the, the right of the individual to determine their own course, that interference from other individuals, but also as nations, our right as nations um, to, to determine our own course without um, interference by other nations. And that, that um, uh, working in the downtown east side, which I did for many years, and I saw lots of exploited Indigenous women, their lives were very much about um, having others, um, often um, men, uh, you know, who would just take and take and take from them and exploit them. And, and uh, you know, this, the, the trauma forced upon them and uh, on many of us, because someone felt like they, that they were... Um, our overseers, our our um, uh, people who could be acted upon, uh, you know that that could cause uh, quite considerable um, damage. So now we know it takes a lot of investment to um, create a strong child, for instance, and we know now that there are hundreds, thousands tens of thousands of things we can do to help a child um, not just survive, but thrive. And so we should be doing those. And as someone who's been um, very privileged, um, much of, um, especially in my later life, I know just how much um, 
someone can receive. And I know just how much or how little um, some some uh, receive. And there needs to be some balance. And definitely um, for Indigenous peoples, um, the lack of investment in um, what we call the social determinants of Indigenous health, uh, the lack of investment in housing, the lack of investment in economic and uh, educational opportunities, the lack of investment in uh, cultural and uh, linguistic preservation, uh, the lack of investment in, um, you know, the the practices that we have on the land, those um, all um, work against our health and well-being and they need to be invested in. Such, such important points. And we know from Canadian Human Rights Tribunal decisions, United Nations decisions, commissions, inquiries and reports that this purposeful, chronic, discriminatory underfunding specifically for Indigenous peoples has helped create this situation, but also helps maintain it. And uh, throughout this program, we've been working our way slowly to you, Dr. Evan. We're going to be looking at the BC report on systemic racism in healthcare. So let's take a look at that right now. 2021. In plain sight, BC report on racism in healthcare investigated racism against Indigenous peoples in the BC healthcare system. Data revealed that 84% of Indigenous peoples experienced racism and discrimination that discouraged them from seeking care, negatively affecting their health. The fifth recommendation is the BC government, First Nations governing bodies and representative organizations, and the Métis Nation of BC jointly develop a strategy to improve the patient complaint process to address individual and systemic Indigenous-specific racism. Please welcome Sirius XM host Eric Alper and Harmony Johnson, co-author of the In Plain Sight BC Report on Racism in Healthcare. Harmony, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, in Plain Sight, the BC Report on Racism in Healthcare. Um, how can we hold the healthcare industry accountable for ending anti-Indigenous racism? I think reports like this are a big part of it. Um, a report like this did the work to surface all available data from people's experience to, to the disproportionate health outcomes that they face as a result of that experience and as a result of racism and discrimination. And it laid it all out in a really clear way. So in some ways, I think reports like this and studies like this are necessary to draw attention to these issues to create some shared understanding about what the problem is and what it looks like. And then I think generate some, some rage about it and generate some um, energy around this being a problem that is unacceptable. So I think in some ways, these reports like this, they, they, they flash a lot of attention on an issue. They can generate a set of momentum towards accountability. I think that's important. We also know that reports like this then very quickly sit on the shelf and people move on to the next thing. So it's quite easy for that, that sense of rage or accountability that comes with these reports to just, you know, kind of taper off. So part of what we recommended in the report was the establishment of a measurement framework. And we tried to set a baseline for that measurement framework in the report itself. We released a whole separate data report that included a whole set of indicators um, and that set out the available data against those indicators. So we're hopeful that, um, that that type of measurement, what gets measured matters, what gets measured gets done. So we've demonstrated that in fact, you can measure racism and you can measure people's experience of cultural safety. And we've recommended that they take that initial starting point. We're not saying it's perfect, but that they take what we've done as a starting point, use it to create a measurement framework, and then report regularly and routinely on those measures and tie that in to the health system's processes for accountability. So hold the health system accountable for achieving a set of targets around Indigenous cultural safety and elimination of racism. Um, tie this into mandate letters, strategic plans, like there are systems for accountability in the system. So our goal here was to hardwire these expectations within those existing processes. It's fascinating in listening to your answer that you didn't mention BC once. And that leads me to think that this type of investigation, all the provinces in Canada 
could read and learn from and take action on. It wasn't just, although the, the report was focused in BC, how would the rest of the provinces benefit from having this? Yeah, it, it's a, the problem is systemic racism, right? So systems um, and the health system is a national system and it has provincial parts of that system. Um, we also know that a lot of systemic racism stems from this Canada being a settler colonial state and having colonial policies about Indigenous people. And again, those span across the entire country. So this is not a problem unique to British Columbia whatsoever. Um, in some ways, we had a unique context in BC and that we had political leadership that was willing to have this type of study done and ready to admit that, yeah, we do think we have racism in our system in BC. Let's study it. Let's surface the problem. Let's take a look at it. Um, we knew there was heavy, heavy national interest in this report throughout the whole process of us developing it. And in fact, in the middle of our process for developing this report, there was the horrific death of Joyce Echequan in Quebec. And that showed us very clearly that this is not a problem specific to the West Coast, but it's a problem right across this country. And in response to that, the federal government hosted a number of dialogues on anti-Indigenous racism in healthcare. And every, a number of the provinces and territories um, participated in that, uh, Indigenous organizations from across the country. So everybody there admitted this is the problem in all of our jurisdictions. I mean, I've spent the last year probably talking about this report 400 times across the country. So, um, so it's definitely not unique to BC. The way we did the report, I hope, lends some support to other regions and jurisdictions that want to tackle um, similar studies. I, I do think that there is value in other regions doing this type of study that's specific to, to their jurisdictions. But we do know that racism, these common stereotypes of Indigenous people, lead to common discriminatory treatment at the point of care. And this is what leads to very common outcome disparities that we see amongst Indigenous populations. Another really important conversation, this time between Eric and Harmony, who really pointed out that although this report was about racism in BC healthcare, that really this is something that impacts all of the provinces and every province and territory should take up this call and shine a light on what they're doing so we can address the problem because we know racism results in injury. It literally can have physical, mental, and spiritual injuries and impact our health. Now, oftentimes, and, and one of the issues that they raised was that we, we might hear of incidents in the media like Joyce Eshaquan, and it gets a lot of attention about the racism that Indigenous patients experience. What the BC report also talked about that doesn't get a whole lot of attention is the experience of Indigenous healthcare professionals themselves working in these systems. Now, Dr. Evan, this might be a bit of a personal question, but have you ever seen these types of racism or face this kind of racism in healthcare settings as an Indigenous healthcare professional? Um, yes, absolutely. I think some of my worst incidences of racism were within the healthcare system amongst my um, very well educated, um, generally um, quite bright uh, colleagues. And uh, it, it, it was definitely puzzling to me when I was going through the system. Now, remember, I started off as a, a, a very low level um, medical student um, with, with no um, authority or privilege or status. And uh, I would be in these workplaces and you would hear casual workplace racism with no repercussion all the time. Uh, th uh, very often the workers wouldn't realize that I was indigenous. They would just say really ugly things. They thought it was completely normal and fine to talk that way, even though um, you know, our spaces are supposed to be safe. And even though they have no business, that, that isn't the work. Your work is not to call people down or call people um, out to be cruel. Um, our work is supposed, we're supposed to help. And, and as I've ascended and, you know, um, you know eventually having staff um, of, of my own, and uh, I pledge to make sure that my environment, my work environment is safe and 
not toxic and where there is repercussion for racism. Uh, workers um, sometimes do need to be spoken to about what was that? I hear something bad happened and you need to talk to me about it. And uh, very often the workers will say, well, no, I, I, you know, I'm not racist. I'm, no one on this staff is racist. Everyone here is really great. Um, nothing needs to change. Uh, I really don't think uh, a racist, anything racist happened here at all. Uh, and then we have to get to, well, you know, let's not be naive. Of course, racism exists. In fact, this report, what was so shocking about this report in BC was just how pervasive racism was, just how many thousands of Indigenous people stepped forward and said, absolutely, I had uh, racist encounters. Uh, and, and so, and so we, uh, we named it and we said, um, we can definitely do better. And the work of anti-racism, which is different from you know, decolonizing the system or transforming the system, the work of anti-racism really is about identifying um, racism and, and knocking it out of the way. And there, there are thousands of ways that racism just pervades our workplaces you can actually see it sometimes when you just bring up you just say like oh i have an aboriginal patient and you can just see the um the negativity the ugliness the the uh, bias um those um pathways in their heads are being triggered and you just think oh please don't give me your baloney today and uh you know and sometimes it comes out and sometimes it doesn't and and I should say, though, as well, um, making this more conscious uh, amongst workers is a great thing. And I've found very many allies in the healthcare system, for sure, too. Well, one of the things I found most ironic about the report is that some of the participants who were in the healthcare system who said that they weren't racist actually used racist stereotypes in defense of their opinion of Native people ergo they're not actually racist and i just it just showed to me how deeply ingrained it is and how appropriate the title of it is that it's in plain sight and some people don't even realize it and based on your experiences and what you do you're a testament to why we need more indigenous peoples in healthcare because you have the lived experience and you can make sure that everyone you work with is in a safe space and then we know the patients will be in a safe space and uh you know melanie this is something that obviously pervades everyone indigenous healthcare professionals because not just in hospital settings it could be in long-term care homes it could be you know in youth homes how can we better support indigenous peoples in whatever healthcare profession that they're actually in yeah, that's a great question, Pam. I mean, there is certainly patient safety that is paramount in all of the work that we do, but you know, our professional and legal safety is just as important. Um, might be different in different jurisdictions, but certainly in Manitoba, we don't find as many Indigenous health professionals working in mainstream systems. Um, they're either working directly with the community or perhaps with FNIB or perhaps with the tribal council. There are a few within the mainstream system or the Western system, but um, trying to protect them as best as we can, um, you know, and, and be there um, for them in different ways. But it, you know, it just that question also triggered kind of my own personal experience where I could, um, uh, given, you know, my fairness, I could have been a chameleon and I could have been whoever I wanted to be when I was going to school or even earlier in my career when I didn't have a lot of influence, that didn't have a lot of power or, um, as mentioned, um, you know, recent ascension into the into my career. But some of the other tools um, that, you know, I would use when I'd visit the or have to take my family into the system. Um, and they were experiencing because of their visibility experiencing overt racism i would start talking in uh, our medical language um and because i was just i was just a family member right and when i changed the language you could see the discomfort um when i could talk like they spoke uh, from a clinical perspective and then they had a different accountability but it shouldn't have to be that way and i often wonder what are our other friends and families experience um, within the healthcare system when they don't have a healthcare provider to help them navigate that or to um, you know to support them uh, during that encounter when you know in real time um, but it is uh, we just have so much to do so much work to do there Pam like that's there's no doubt about that 
Well, I think the good news is, is that you're out there and you're doing this good work. And that really creates hope for all of us. It creates real hope for change, basically change in action. So instead of just in the old days, it's reports saying we need to do X, Y, and Z. Now Indigenous peoples are in these positions. They're pushing, they're standing up for our colleagues, they're standing up for our patients. They're making real differences. And I think that's, you know, the heart of this BC report on racism. It's actually very hopeful. It's like, here's, here's the problem. You can't fix it unless you confront it head on and be uncomfortable with the truth of it and then we'll all be better for it in the end and you two are just so inspiring i'm personally thankful and i know the people that you probably work with and all of the families that you've helped are probably thankful for everything that you do to lead the way in such a positive way you know to inspire the rest of us to help eliminate racism in healthcare make sure that indigenous peoples get access to health care so that we are not stuck here 10 years from now and indigenous peoples are still dying of cancer at disproportionate rates and still have disproportionate rates of diabetes that we can work on this together so thank you both so much for sharing your personal experiences but also your knowledge and your insights about all these reports and all of these issues and making the time because i, I can only imagine as indigenous peoples in the healthcare system, how much people must actually call on you. And so thank you, Dr. Evan Adams, you know, chief medical officer, First Nations Health Authority and famous actor. I've got to get his autograph someday. And Melanie, you too. I don't know how you do what you do in all of these different executive director and other positions you have, but I guess that's why you're one of the top 100 most powerful women. So so no surprise there. Thank you again, my friends. And I'm Pam Palmiter. So happy to have been a part of this. Thank you, everybody. Well, Alan. Thanks for listening to Turtle Island Talks, an exclusive Sirius XM town hall. Turtle Island Talks is produced by Kim Wheeler, Sarah Burke, Kaylin Belair, and Siobhan Woodrow. For more news, music, and views from Turtle Island, or to hear this show again, search The Indigiverse online and in the SiriusXM app.